Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Visual Studio Remote Office Hours. I'm your host, Mads Christensen, and uh, today we're going to talk about Visual Studio benefits. Uh, believe it or not, there's a bunch of stuff that comes along with your Visual Studio subscription that uh, you may not know that you can take advantage of. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, I'm very excited because I know very little about it. So I'm going to see how much I can learn here in the next hour or so. And to help me, I got with me uh, James. Hello, James. How are you today? Hey, Mads. How are you doing? Doing well. I'm glad to hear it. James, do you mind introducing yourself to the audience? Sure. Uh, I'm uh, James Tremel. I'm a senior PM in our developer division, and I work a lot on uh, Azure for developers, dev test, and, and Visual Studio. All right. So um, there's a lot of details around this. There's uh, I've heard this term thrown around like Azure dev test, and you might be using Visual Studio and think, this whole Azure thing, I'm not using that right now, so that's not relevant. Uh, but hang on now, because it might be. Uh, and you might be surprised here. Uh, I am for sure of some of the stuff I do know, I was very surprised about. And so uh, I think before we kind of dive into the specifics, James, do you mind like kind of just take us back and explain what is Visual Studio benefits? What do you get and how does it all work? That's a great question, Mads. Okay, so um, Visual Studio benefits are, not necessarily uh, new. Um, we used to call it MSDN back in the day, and it was great when you were a developer um, and you, you would receive these packs of CDs in the mail, and you could have all of Microsoft software basically for free um, to install and write code against, whether it's Windows or server or what have you. We've kind of transitioned that program over the years to, to be Visual Studio uh, benefits, Visual Studio subscription benefits. And that's, um, the, the premise is still generally the same, however. We provide discounts on software, um, uh, such as things you install locally or on a, a machine somewhere. Um, but we also have modernized a little bit. So we provide discounts in Azure itself, up to 50% of some of our software, um, like an Azure VM, for example. Um, but not only that, but Mads, did you know that um, if you have Visual Studio Enterprise, I'm basically going to give you two thousand, almost two thousand dollars a year, just just to to use uh, in Azure. Uh, I knew that we get like one hundred and fifty dollars a month of Azure credits. Is that that mounts up to two thousand dollars a year? Eighteen hundred. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> so not when you say it like that, that's a, that's a lot of money you get for free. And if you have like a team of like a hundred, I mean, think about it compounded, right? Right. But <laughs> Maybe more importantly, what are you going to use it for? If I'm not hosting my stuff on Azure, for instance, then as a Visual Studio developer, I'm sitting on my home machine here, right? I'm in my garage. I'm coding away on my Visual Studio Pro or Enterprise. And and what do I need the Azure VMs for? Like what is even like what is what is it? Why does it apply to me? Great question. So one of the main reasons you would use it uh, essentially is for um, anything you are deploying against or trying. So for example, um, even though Azure is one of the benefits, there are many others like, like App Center and things like Azure DevOps. Um, and that you can basically, let's say you're a mobile developer, you can you know, kind of write some, write some code against a mobile app and then kind of use App Center to kind of test against it. For Azure specifically, um, if you are writing anything and you want to test it out, um, the credits are a great way to do that. So let's say, for example, you're an integration developer working on some APIs or something like that, and you either want to try it in a different language or maybe you're converting, like, you know, um, you know SOAP to REST or something like that, and you want to see how this works and with this route or that route or against this query or this database, you can do all that. And without, I mean, if you really wanted to, you could put all that stuff on your local computer um, and go that way. Um, but it gets a little crowded sometimes for a lot of computers. And so having that a whole Azure data center at your disposal um, is, is convenient. Okay. So hang on. Does that mean that if I, so let's say I'm writing, um, I'm writing some sort of web application and I could run that all on my machine, which I do as I develop it. But in order for me to test it on like, some sort of configuration that I don't have locally, 
I could spin up a VM in the cloud. And is that then the same type of, is, can I just RDP into that? Is it like, if I had my own uh, VM sort of that I would use on my own machine, but it's just hosted in the cloud, is that kind of what you're going for? That's exactly right. The credit subscription is basically, the individual credit subscription is kind of like your own Azure. Like you have complete control over it. And the other nice thing about that, if you think about it, if you're working for a company or something like that, um, you probably don't have access to your company's identity infrastructure or security infrastructure, um, but maybe you need to create a service principal or something like that. Um, rather than doing that against your corporate credentials, which you probably don't have access to anyway, you can do that in Azure to do um, to try it out and make sure it works and then submit that PR or you know, make that request into your change management system, however it makes sense. So, so if you're using enterprise or pro, in like in a in a in your company, then it's it's you individually, your credentials that you use to sign into Visual Studio with, whatever that might be, that you know, that is also an Azure account at the same time that you can you have that money, you have those credits, so you for free can use it. It's not something you have to go through your company to enable or ask them, go to IT and say, hey, can I have this? You already have access to it. Is that do I understand that right? That's exactly right, and th and that's one of the uh, the initial uh, inception of just the Azure Credits benefit was just that purpose. We wanted to provide uh, individual developers with an isolated uh, tenant uh, and Azure subscription, so they couldn't break anything, or they couldn't like you know mess anything up, or they could literally do whatever they wanted to and just enjoy it without having the fear of like oh, well, I just started, you know, spending it like, you know, more money than I had planned on or something like that. It was a way to, to have that peace of mind when you did it. But beyond that, you know, now it's kind of um, the other uh, nice piece about how you can use these things is you can kind of transfer them back and forth. So let's say, uh, for example, you're a security engineer and you want to uh, your your company's like a Cisco shop and you want to try those Barracuda appliance for whatever reason. And maybe you heard something about it. It's it's good and, and you want to check it out. So um, you can provision that as an appliance like in Azure, for example. You can test it out, change the firewall rules, and you can do that in a way that is not going to um, put your company in any kind of additional liability because it's completely isolated. When you're happy with it, you know it works and does what you expected based on whatever feature you were looking for, you can then take the template of that or show somebody else, and you can then deploy it in your company's subscription, Azure subscription, or vice versa. And that's one of the things that's quite compelling is there's a myriad of different methods and um, uh, kind of protocols you can follow to basically take whatever you created on your own and bring it into your company uh, via DevOps process, via um, just a direct deployment, um, via some security. There are some companies that are creating uh, even separate dev directories um, for Azure uh, just for that purpose. Nice. So so one of the things I was thinking about, like uh, kind of when you were explaining uh, some of these benefits is that I can take an app. So, so here, here, here's the thing that I've struggled with in the past, and you know, in former jobs that I've had as a developer was that, you know, at some point in time, you you're gonna have to maintain some legacy code that you haven't, that you very rarely deal with, and not a lot of your colleagues are comfortable doing it, and you have to set up a machine for it. So maybe you have to change some settings or environment variables to bring that down to your machine to be able to run it and fix a bug, and then you know, commit the, the things back or deploy it. Could I use this uh, Azure dev test benefit here to have a VM in the cloud that I can put my legacy code base into? And so I'll whenever there's a bug coming in, like once every six months or once a year or whatever, I can just spin that VM up and I know it will run my app. I have already configured it. Then I can easily change my... Um, do my code change and commit it to source control, whatever, and then put down the VM again. And that means I only, that means I have an isolated environment that is frozen in time. It will always be at that state. I'm not changing anything. So I can always maintain my legacy app in that. And I don't pay for it when I don't use it, right? I only pay when I have, when I'm connected to it, the VM. If I shut it down, 
it still remembers everything. Everything is stored there, but I don't pay. Is that, or do I still pay a little bit? Yeah. So that's, that's exactly. So it, it, it depends on how you have it, right? So if there's data in there, maybe you're paying for some long-term storage or something like that. But if it's just um, a script that configures a machine a certain way, then there's no other cost. You basically keep that, that infrastructure as code in a repo somewhere and you can produce it whenever you need to. Now, this is the thing that uh, is, in my opinion, kind of enabled the idea of DevOps, a lot of it. Basically, the idea of kind of commodity infrastructure or something you can kind of provision on demand, which is one of the great things about Azure. There's nowhere kind of like waiting for a new rack or a new server to come in or you maybe keep a machine under your desk um, that you know you have to maintain or break, it could break at any time. You could basically have an on-demand kind of environment to use. Um, and this actually um, brings a kind of an interesting nuance here. So, um, so to dev test, uh, at least as far as the credit goes, is not only just your credits, but there's also the discounts. There's also where your company can provision an enterprise dev test subscription, which is they would then manage. It would be a little different than credits because your company would manage it, but it is kind of like the, 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 the dev environment or the dev server, the dev stage that you might have full access to within an Azure subscription, but it is uh, kind of billed differently for lack of a better term. But going back to the billing point, if you're working on any kind of VDI or any kind of thin client machinery, like like uh, let's say like hospital systems have all these like um, you know little terminals and things like that, or trading systems, and or your deployment targets are uh, you know like websites that that maybe replicate and uh, cross a couple of machines and different configurations based on different requirements in different regions. Um, then Azure is fantastic for that because you can save all those settings and configurations and as you were just talking about magic and then provision then uh, when you need them as you need them to do whatever you want and you can bring it up in the same way it was or if you're maybe a more church of op shop maybe there's someone that has configured the previous environment a little differently for whatever reason you can you know kind of take that down apply the new config and compare that with the old config and you can have two so you have the original one that you had at first, and then you have the new one where um, you can see maybe what's changed. Does that break your code? Does it um, not break your code? <laughs> Does it create any additional abilities or complexities? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, I mean, there's some, some very immediate sort of down-to-earth type of benefits to this. But you know, I'm always when it comes to when it comes to sort of Azure and I'm using credits, it's I'm spinning up my VM. I'm just you know I would just like RDP into it, you know. And so I don't necessarily know how we lost James. Come back, James. I think his browser died or something. <laughs> oh, here he comes. Did your browser just die? I know I pushed the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, sorry. So, will will there ever? So, I never know like how many of my credit, like one hundred and fifty dollars a month or fifty dollars, if it's pro versus enterprise. There's different levels. I think we should talk about that too. Um, but how do I know how much time I have available to do these things? Uh, can I can I can I work in a, in a VM, for instance, every day for the for that price, or or is it going to be more expensive? Like. I guess there's a little bit of uh, maybe fear on my part. Like, what if I accidentally use more than those 150? Do I get billed on my personal credit card and all this sort of stuff? Um, so I guess I got two questions. Will I ever have to pay if I overuse my my credits or whatever? Or and then also, how do I how do I make sure that I know how much I'm using as I go along? Um, <laughs> that's a, that's a complex question. Um, let me, let me, let me maybe show you a few things that might, might help there. And then you can, okay. that might, that might help quite a bit, um, explain some of the nuances there. But the, the answer long and short is no, if you're using your credits and you run out, you're done. It's, it's, everything turns off. You just can't access it. Now, the other part of that, that is relatively interesting is there are some, customers and some folks that systematically or, or on purpose add a credit card to remove the spending limit. So if you go over your credits, you can still keep using it and keep paying for it. 
um, but you still get the same discount applied for that syst that whatever system you're using. So that's that's the other that's the other component there. And then beyond that, again, is that whole enterprise dev test thing, which that is basically completely um, uh, the spend all goes to your company's invoicing system, however they choose to do it. So it could be a line of credit, it could be a credit card, whatever they've set up with Microsoft. Um, and that is kind of unlimited spend, but then the way you control that is with essentially the same Azure controls that we have today, like quotas and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Did you want to show your screen or? Yeah. Let me let me show a little bit about a little more about how this works. Let me let me pull up a couple. Yeah. Of things here. This is very interesting. Like I'm I, the whole idea of the whole legacy app, and I can have an an environment frozen in time, and I don't have to maintain that a machine under the desk or anything for that. To me, is extremely compelling. Like I've been in a situation like this in in different companies where it's been an issue, and uh, this would be, this would solve that completely. Solve it. Well, cool. That's okay. that's. We're hoping that's how it helps. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you should see my screen here, correct? Uh, there yeah. we go. You're, you're. I think you're uh, sharing the wrong screen. There we go. There we go. Okay. Cool. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So let me log into this account here. Um, and this is. Uh, so this is a. Um, what are you logging into? Where, where are you going? What is this? So this is Azure. Do you see? Do you see a, a kind so of? So this a is a portal.azure.com. This is the official, just regular Azure website. This is this is Azure. This is, mm -hmm. and what's compelling about this is is Azure is Azure is Azure. So like, uh, and you see what popped up here. These are some of the subscriptions I have access to. That this is how much money I have remaining on those subscriptions. And when those run out, those those close down. But kind of going back a little bit here, this. The Azure credit subscription is, is Azure just like any other Azure. And to kind of understand a little bit about how this works, um, let me kind of pull this up here. Let me go to actually a pricing calculator. Azure pricing calculator. Uh, let's check it out here. Okay. So the first thing to understand is that pretty much everything in Azure has kind of a meter to it, right? Um, and that's basically the, the thing that, that costs money. And let's say you're going to use like AVM. And we're just going to click this one here. This is the Azure Pricing Calculator. You can find it kind of right there. Um, there you go, pricing slash calculator. Mm -hmm. um, and listen, you pick the VM and it drops down into this little calculator box here. And this is just the standard one. There are bigger ones, smaller ones, but this, this is just the default one it brings up for me. Um, the DTUV3. And if I keep that on, like all the time, <laughs> like for an entire month, it's going to cost me $152. But if you scroll out to the bottom here, there's this little button that says show dev test pricing. If I mm -hmm. click this button, does some calculations, so on and so forth. And now it's quite a bit cheaper. Wow, it almost dropped in half. Yes. So, so you get so that's part of the discount you just get by being a Visual Studio subscriber. Correct. All the dev test pricing, which is all Visual Studio subscribers that that are um, eligible for that, are correct. So, nice. so that's that's so let me let me show this real quick. This is kind of a high level overview of this. Um, so there are um, three different primary offer types. There's your credits, which we were talking about there. There's the enterprise and there's pay-as-you-go dev test. These all require the Visual Studio subscription, but they all get the same discounts. Um, so that calculator just shows you with that VM kind of at half price. Mm -hmm. That works in any one of these three um, basically offer types, um, which are the different types of offers you can take advantage of as a Visual Studio subscriber. There's actually a couple versions of that. So the credits come in. There's about four different offers for the credits based on the kind of uh, SKU you have. So let's say you have like um, our platform SKU, you still get a hundred bucks a month, but it's called a slightly different number. But these two here are more organizational focused and the discount still applies to all of this, no matter what. Okay. But let's get back to your question. Uh, yeah. Can you uh, go back to the pricing calculator? So, because I look right here, it says that enterprise get $150 a month and pro 
subscription gets 50. And now you're saying the monthly cost here is 85. So that means if I use the VM for a full month, it'll cost me 85. So if I just need it to work like one day out of the month to work on my legacy app, or I use it like when we come up to a milestone and I have to test my app using the configuration of that VM in the cloud, even with the pro uh, subscription, the Visual Studio Pro, I'm not gonna deplete that at all. No, let's say I use it for one day. No. It cost me a dollar. <laughs> one dollar a day. Yes. <laughs> so, and as for a standard day, I mean, most people I know, uh, Mads, don't stay up 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So what um, kind of machine are we talking about here? Is that the smallest little machine or is that a... It's eight gigs what? too. So, it, I mean, it's not the smallest. They're definitely a lot bigger and a lot smaller too. Oh, so you can scale up and down here. Oh, yeah. So I can go up to like a bigger machine here. Let's, uh, let's so go to really next neat. series. This okay. is uh, 16 core, 32 gigs RAM. That oh. costs me $8 a day. Okay. So even with a super beefy machine like that, it's eight dollars to run your like per month, let's say, to handle your legacy app, or per even not even per month, maybe per six years. Oh, sorry, six months, right? Yeah. Okay. And again, like uh, unless you don't take lunch or go to the restroom or go to meetings, you know that that's eight hours, <laughs> so it's great. Yeah. Um, so if you only use it for a couple hours, it just goes down from there, and then the next day you can reprovision it. Um, you know, basically as as much as it makes sense to you. Wow. Again, if I unclick this, we should see a change. Yep, now it's uh, fourteen dollars. If yep. I don't have, if I don't provision this in a Visual Studio subscription, a Visual okay. Studio credit or dev test subscription. And so, if I accidentally leave my VM open and makes it so that it never shuts down or whatever, just to make be absolutely sure here, I'm not going to be billed. You're just going to shut me down by default. Correct. By default, you're just going to shut the service down and say, okay. Not until the next month begins, and and you have another hundred and fifty dollars or fifty dollars, uh, we're gonna we're gonna allow you to start it up again. But I'm not losing anything. I'm not. You know, it's not like my data goes away, right? Correct. So basically, you just kind of lose access to it. Um, so here, I can kind of look at this. This is uh, one of the subscriptions I have here, and you can see kind of over time, kind of what happens with it. So I this one actually said MSDN, like you were talking about. Like we used to call it MSDN. I get I guess in Azure Portal, it's still called MSDN. But this is, this is when you see MSDN. Do we then? It basically means the Visual Studio benefits or subscriptions. Is that what it means? Correct. Okay. Correct. And then that's and that you know that that's that something we are working to clean up um, in a few places. Uh, but uh, um, you know, it, it, there's there's a, a few of them here and there um, that yeah, there's a few places that still exist. But I can go ahead and look, and I can see um, basically what happens over time with my app. This is so. This is the Azure Cost Management Center. And um, let's say, for example, um, I'm working on a, a three-tier app, you know, database, middle layer, web layer, and uh, I have a SQL Server appliance or maybe SQL Azure or even Cosmos or something like that. And um, it is designed to be up. So those things can basically be a little more costly because they have all kinds of fail safes in place to make sure that they're always working. So you might want to watch those in there and then kind of turn those off separately. Of course, the the simplest way to do that is keep everything within one resource group that you can then mm -hmm. delete or what have you. But um, this is a way you can look and understand that. And if you do run over, you can um, you know just come back to it when your month renews. If you need it that day, you can add a credit card and get it back, and then you know kind of just turn it off immediately if you're done. Um, it's going to be there for you. So that actually happened to me. <laughs> Because I've been using, I've been, I host all my websites up on Azure, and I have for many years, and um, and then I have this one one website called schemastore.org, and it kind of has just slowly been gaining in popularity, and and now it's become real popular. So now I'm actually exceeding my my 150 monthly dollars that I buy like a dollar. So now I have to pay a dollar a month. But what happened was like on day 29 of the of a month, the first month that it went over, it just stopped. And I got a notification say, "Hey, this is about to stop. Do you want to, you know, uh, you know, remove that sort of auto stopping mechanism, uh, or not?" And so I was just, like, "Yeah, yeah." And I gave it my credit card, and I paid like a dollar. <laughs> so it cost me like a dollar a month, basically. But that that was actually a very pleasant surprise that uh, that it does just shut down. I don't accidentally pay for stuff. Um, 
And and even if it did, right, it would just be down for the remainder of that month. And then I could make my changes to it afterwards. And so it's so even if it does, it's not the end of the world. Exactly. And that's one of the great things about kind of this this whole um, concept of, of dev test or, you know, basically if you think about the, the standard kind of stages for deployment uh, for any kind of application, if you have the situation like you were just talking about um, and you're not sure how it's going to cost or how much it's going to cost, you can do it like in your credits, you can have a provision there or in one of these um, enterprise ones where you can kind of watch the cost and then you can use just some of the built-in benefits of Azure, like the cost management center to then, it'll the cost management center will actually tell you, hey, Mad, you're using like an F-series VM um, that's only using about 20% capacity. You can probably download that to a D-series and save like half the cost. Mm -hmm. So it's one of these great things that just, you know, if you have it in a place that's a little safer or maybe in a subscription type that is, you know, certainly not production. You can, of course, learn about this in production all you want. Mm -hmm. But if you have it before production, you can maybe if you're working on something new, like you want to add value to your business, you can like, you know, tell like, hey, if we were to modernize this old application and put it on like an app service, like I have the old one on a this VM and it costs us like 50 bucks a month. But look on app service, I just move the code over, maybe make a couple updates. I'm now running in a PaaS environment. And that's only cost me 10 bucks a month. Yeah. You can use that as a, a great way to, um, you know, help, uh, help get that next promotion. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's a, it's a, you can use it as a playground for experimentation. Exactly. That's a really good, you know, I want to tell you a story and you might've heard this from others. I don't know if it's a unique story, but I used to be, I used to work at a startup and we got bought by a big enterprise company. I won't, I won't name names here, but there, uh, once we once we got into sort of the big enterprise company, they had a very strict IT department that was very like, on lockdown security and all this sort of stuff. And if we ever wanted to make a deployment, if we it was a website, part of it was a website, and we just were used to just deploying it. I think it was a little bit before the whole CI/CD pipeline thing, so I, I think it was maybe a manual button that we pushed. Um, but all of a sudden, it was like we had to fax, yes, fax my, the <laughs> IT department like with some forms and like, oh, here's the payloads and the artifacts when you were to deploy it to these servers and all that sort of stuff. And it was a pain. <laughs> so, and this was also like in the beginning of when Azure kind of started. Mm -hmm. And so we had this, we had this uh, um, thing where we said, okay, let's just try to see what happens. What if we see if we just deploy straight to Azure instead of that IT department's uh, um, data center? Can we actually run? Will it actually work? And we did, and uh, and yes, it did work, and it, it worked absolutely fine. Uh, the same, it works the same as if it was hosted on uh, sort of on, on our local data center, if you will. Um, and so we just asked the uh, we told that to the IT department, say, hey, we kind of don't need you anymore. We're we're just going to do this on our own, and like within a day or something like that, it's like we no longer need permission and faxing things in and all that sort of stuff. And we can just like ad hoc deploy. And so that was a, a that was a kind of a great experience where we used that as an experimentation tool. But this was long before there was anything called dev test benefits and Azure credits or all that sort of stuff. So we, at that time we just paid for it, but we didn't pay much because it didn't take us more than like two, three days to kind of uh, massage the product in a way that we could just upload it to a different um, server environment. So, uh, yeah, so that was a great success. Now, in all fairness, Mads, you know, friends don't let friends right-click deploy, right? Um, <laughs> so, so, and and the, the reason behind, like, I mean, and that, that that's a great story, but it is, it does let you as a developer, and with, you know, certainly this individual credit thing, you have yours and you can just try it out and you can kind of show someone else kind of how, how easy this kind of works. But one of the things that becomes kind of critical, at least for most organizations, is something like the data. Mm -hmm. So that's maybe a reason why, for example, you may not be allowed to access certain types of data because it might have personal information in it. It might have not meet certain um, regional compliance requirements, things of that nature. So for example, you might have full access to deploy here or maybe even here, but maybe not here where the, maybe it attaches to the data. And I don't know about you, but I've seen like, you know, a lot of different scenarios of this. You know, the typical one is like, 
dev test prod, right? Um, yeah. Maybe it's your local machine, maybe there's production, maybe there's something in between. Um, but I've seen some companies have as many as 11 or 13 of these different stages of which you might have access to some things, but not everything. And that's, again, kind of great because this dev test benefit, all those things that are not production facing, you can still get those discounts for. And that way your whole department can kind of essentially um, have some cost savings, which you know, is a little, certainly in this, this, this certain time of the uh, time in our lives, um, this is it's, it's an important thing to be a little more sensitive to, to expenditures. Um, but you not only get that discount, but you can see we can maintain that kind of data sovereignty or that data um, integrity by making sure that whatever code you do use, you're either using it in a secure fashion, in a secure, like, isolated network, um, which you might have access to or you might not. At the same time, regardless, that's what all these stages are about. They're about saving money and getting, um, basically getting to market faster with all these different services you get in Azure. Yeah. So we got to, can you auto shut down a VM when you don't need it? Of course. So there are um, there are a few different ways to do that. I probably shouldn't have uh, closed my screen here. <laughs> um, okay, so go back here. And and why would you do this? You would do this to cut costs so that you don't accidentally let it run longer than you have to. Exactly. <laughs> we got some inception going on here. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a couple of ways to do that. So um, you know, one of the, the simple ways is basically you can. Um, just do the, the manual thing where you go into a machine. Um, let's see, do I have a, there's an old, old website. Oh, I don't have access to that one anymore. <laughs> let's see if I can access this thing. Okay. Oh my gosh. Um, all right. Hold on a second. Do you still work for Microsoft? I hope so. You know, maybe this is a new day and this is a, this will be an exciting uh, post tomorrow. Um, <laughs> all right. So, um, uh, let's see, where do I have some stuff? Well, maybe we could just, maybe we could just explain that if you go to the, if you click into your VM, you can set up the automatic schedule. Yes. You can use Azure, Azure automation, for example, mm -hmm. you can use, um, uh, different services. Here we go. Um, right. so, um, so you can to, to basically access X, Y, or Z, um, and you can choose like, for example, so. The app service, right? App service is a, is a way to run compute. It's kind of like it's PaaS. So uh, the way I like to explain PaaS, at least for, for um, from the developer perspective, is that rather than having a whole machine that might serve up like IIS to, to, to show your, your, your HTML and what have you, um, uh, PaaS is basically just the IIS tree without the hardware. So you don't have to worry about storage or the OS or anything like that. You just manage the kind of the directory. Um, and the thing about an app service is they have different things called app service plans. App service plans basically allow you to set um, basically a tolerance to basically keep up or um, um, not use or not over allocate different spend requirements. So um, that doesn't automatically shut it down, but let's say you don't need as much uptime on it uh, or as much availability for this app website, you can charge that app service plan to lower your costs. But beyond that, there are things like Azure Automation um, to basically allow you to um, automatically delete machines, or there's something like Dev Test Labs, um, which is like not Dev Test Labs is not Azure Dev Test, but it's a it's a very similar um, uh, name. And what you can do with that, so Azure Dev Test Labs provides a great management node of compute. Um, so let me go into this one here. And uh, can you click the hide on that banner at the bottom there? This is oh, yeah. Thing. yeah. There we go. Thank you. Um, so here's my Area 51 um, uh, Azure Dev Test Labs, and there are basically uh, methods within Dev Test Labs itself so that you can basically set auto shutdown or spin up of different machines at different times. Now this has value in a couple of different areas. So for example, if you're maybe running a, a lab, like a teaching lab, you can use this. If you're doing EDI, you can use this. But if you're doing like even testing of applications, you can spin up like 30 machines. And basically when there, a PR comes in and you're trying to test this out, you can literally deploy your, like spin this up, turn them all on, deploy your code, 
um, run some telemetry on it, and then turn it off when you're done using this very simple management node to basically do that. So these are policies on these machines and basically decide when you want to turn it on, when you want to turn it off, so on and so forth. And again, this is what an individual person can do. It doesn't have to be the IT department of your company that does this. Correct. Mm -hmm. And again, if, if even if it's not your IT department, maybe you can show your IT department how this works. Yep. <laughs> and then, or you can say, hey, you should get one of these you know, cool subscriptions because you all kind of fun so, stuff. I, I was just thinking of something. Um, yeah. You know, there's a lot of companies that kind of restricts what software you can install on your computer, right? For, for various reasons, whether it's security, it's probably security. Um, so you can't install like uh, paint.net and you really have to, sometimes you have to do photo editing, but they don't allow for that. There's nothing stopping you, right? For you can go in, create the VM in Azure and you can install those apps there. So all you need, to, all you need to be able to do from your local machine is that you need to be allowed for security um, from the IT department to connect to a VM, to do an RTP call. And if they allow for that, then you can install all those things up there, including SQL Server. Like if you, you were mentioning that, um, you know, maybe you have some data in a, in a SQL Server instance that you have to, you have to remember to shut that down too, uh, not just your VM. But if you install SQL Server in your VM, then it all shuts down together and you have that isolation, right? But you can install everything you want in that VM. It is yours, um, and and that's one of the uh, again the interesting nuances here. So, um, pretty important is understanding kind of how. Are you sharing your? You don't share. You're not sharing your screen. If you, I got to click the oh. pick, pick this pick the monitor, so I, I, that way I can get the the oh. thing that came out here. Okay, oh. um, so so the way to um, uh, understand a lot of this, um, and actually some of this is, is let me kind of get rid of that. Um, so. Basically, the way to understand a lot of this is that uh, the way the hierarchy works as far as Azure is all kind of based on, uh, you know, basically a, a set of rules, right? So if you are at the highest level, you are able to control everything downstream following basic, you know, um, security uh, role-based access control. So that basically if I have uh, like on-premise, if I have access to an Active Directory forest, I might act into many different domains, like maybe Microsoft and Contoso and Tailspin. Um, and then I might then also have access to a machine uh, that might have other machines on it. And that, of course, gives me, if I have that level of access, I have access to all the machines underneath it. So depending on where you sit in this hierarchy, it depends on how much control you have. And so going back to this credit, kind of start this, this understanding this Azure credit subscriptions, you basically have kind of this top level domain admin level control over this credit subscription. So basically you have the ability to create resource groups and anything in Azure, and you have at least three layers of control right there out of the box. So for example, um, if you're an enterprise and you have this in your regular Azure enterprise enrollment um, and you create a subscription, you can give a developer access to a VM, but the, the developer may not be able to access the resource group that control has the VNet in it, and they certainly can't access the subscription, which may be tied to an active directory tenant. Now, the other thing that becomes a little interesting here is the concept of an Azure enrollment. So this is basically how organizations manage a lot of Azure. They can create different Azure subscriptions. These Azure subscriptions is what creates the resource groups and the meters, so that that's how that spend occurs. Now, usually um, for most of these subscriptions, developers don't always get access to uh, this, these higher levels, but they might for a, for example, a non-production compute subscription. For example, like this one right here, like uh, let's say a shared environment or a shared subscription, I might decide as an enterprise IT admin to create that as an enterprise dev test subscription. And I might create that in a dev directory, which then gives developers access to do what they would like. And then as far as a DevOps kind of process, I might take, if I choose to take some code or infrastructure's code that is developed in this subscription, I might then put it in another dev test subscription that the developer doesn't have as much access to. And that way I can maybe tie it into other data, which mm -hmm. may be more sensitive. 
Okay. Okay. Let's back up just a little bit. Um, I didn't quite understand that. So I guess my question is, is it such that when I, if I work at a company that has enterprise licenses, so I, that means that all the developers have their own personal um, enterprise subscription, but they have that probably on their company email address. So not on their personal Microsoft account, but on the, the one that comes. So it would be like mads at, my, at mycompany.com because the my company domain is what uh, has, is where the subscription kind of belongs to or comes from or something like that. Does that mean that the IT department of my company can go in and, and restrict all of the developers in my company from accessing like these VMs, these this dev test environment so that I maybe I can't on a personal level go in and create these resources and use them and use my Azure, Azure credit toward them? Great question. Okay. So it depends, um, but generally speaking, if I create my credit subscription with a non-work account, um, like say for example, my outlook.com account, when I provision that the same way I provision kind of this MSN account, notice that in here, basically there's no one else in uh, that I can give access to, for example, in my company. So for example, I click here and I try to find, you know, someone named Mads, um, it, I have no one, I have no idea who Mads is. Um, that's because I'm in a completely different tenant directory associated with my MSN account. So basically when I come in here to Azure Active Directory, which is the identity mechanism that provisions all this, I can go and look in here and I can see myself in here, but Mads does not exist. If I were to add Mads, I can invite him as either a guest user with his Microsoft.com account, or I can create an, his own, um, I can create a, a, a Mads at MSN.com kind of uh, Mads at MSN.com to give him a Mads at uh, AOL.com. <laughs> exactly. Now, the converse of that is basically what happens in this enterprise scenario, right? So um, basically in the enterprise scenario, um, the company owns the Azure Directory tree. So if you're working at Contoso and I'm a Contoso developer, Contoso admins can create Azure subscriptions in Contoso that I have to have a Contoso email address to access. And of course, if they want to vet an AOL user, they can, but that's, that's up to them. I wouldn't recommend it necessarily. Um, but if they wanted to, they could in the same way you can if you own your own credit subscription. Okay. All right. So, so just with a, with a yes or no answer, can, are there ways that I can, that my company can decide on my behalf that I cannot create uh, dev test VMs on my subscription? Depends on how it's provisioned. <laughs> so yes, it can, there's a way that it can be prevented. Yes. So like your company can choose, for example, not to let you have credit subscriptions. Um, oh, you, so they say we want to take the credit. We're not going to pass the credits on to you, something like that? Not going to let them, not anybody have credits at all. They, they can do that. Uh -huh. um, they can um, let you provision, like completely isolate it. Uh -huh. um, so that like, you know, at Microsoft, for example, I, I can't have a credit subscription tied to my Microsoft.com uh, corporate account. It's got to be completely separate. Um, and, uh, and that's one way companies go. Um, and then the other way companies can go is we see every, every kind of end of the spectrum. So for example, there are some companies that when they create this credit subscription, they might provision it on your behalf, um, with like, let's say a Contoso dev domain. And then they may choose to go in here into this access control and give some administrator at Contoso, uh, subscription to admin rights to be able to monitor or have telemetry on what you do in your credit subscription. And then there are also ways you can basically, basically tie that credit subscription into your corporate AD tenant in which IT has complete control um, to be able to monitor what you do. That Okay, so that, that really gives a lot of power to the company. Like you can really uh, kind of customize this to however your company needs to, um, operate in the world from a security perspective or whatever it is, and still give as much flexibility to the individual developers as, as needed. 
Yes. And so I, there's, so there's a, I guess what I'm going for is like, whether you're a developer or whether you're the IT admin, you get like best of both worlds here. Exactly. And that's the whole point. Because basically it, it, it depends on how your company approaches innovation and how they like to basically um, uh, you know, accelerate the work you're doing. So uh, some companies choose to do that. So maybe they'll give you a day, a week to basically go and innovate, but they want that done completely out, out of the picture. And then you come back on like, you know, uh, you do it on a Wednesday, come back on Thursday. Hey, this is what I built. Let's all take a look. And then you can decide to, to move forward or not. There are some companies that, you know, want to control all of it. There's some companies that want to do none of it. Um, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're lucky enough as a developer to create a greenfield application, awesome. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I hope we get to do a couple of those. Um, and, uh, but oftentimes usually you're, you're working on someone else's code and that code may have different, um, you know, intellectual property assigned to it. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, you know, depending on how the company sees that or uses it depends on how they may want you to write code against it. For example, if you are using open source technologies and maybe even open source your code base or part of your code base, you may want to be completely in the open about that, or you should be completely in the open about that. And that's how you should basically govern those practices, in which case it's completely open to what you do. Um, in the other case where it's completely proprietary, like there's a very sensitive algorithm, you know, like if you, for example, um, have access to the, the KFC secret recipe, um, they don't, you know, you probably shouldn't be sharing that out. <laughs> right. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, well, that, that makes good sense. Okay. So, you know, I would, I was just thinking of another scenario. Let's say you go, because you were mentioning open source. So I want to contribute to a lot of open source, but a lot of times it's like hard to set up your machine, right? Uh, because you have to like now change your machine to be able to even compile and run. But here you can do the same. You can set up a VM, clone the clone the repository from GitHub, let's say, and you know install all the things you need on that machine, and you can send your pull request and all that sort of stuff, and then again freeze that machine in time, or just get rid of it when you're done because you only wanted to send one pull request and be done with it. And uh, that's another scenario here. Well, I mean that that is that is a great scenario, um, and and I, I might plug one of my products I help launch uh, called Code Spaces for that a little bit. <laughs> well, Codespaces, uh, Codespaces uh, manages is going to manage all that stuff for you by installing those dependencies, so you don't even have to do that on your own. So that's a much smoother experience. But at least now I can. But here's another way in which I can get that, a full VM experience. That is that is a, a complete isolated thing. Exactly. It so touch my machine. So the the one scenario, let's say. Um, if you like what Codespaces kind of provides you, but maybe you want your own DIY experience, you can do that. Um, like so basically you can create your own kind of like machines with its own dependencies to keep them the way you want them. And you want to manage that in your way. And even if you have a team and you want to enforce them all to use X, Y, Z and this and this network, whatever, you can do all that yourself and then provide the DIY capability to remote into that machine very much like a code space experience. Mm -hmm. We call it kind of the DIY version of that. And, and so if you want to go that route, you absolutely can. And this is how you would do that. You would basically set up those machines in Azure. Um, you probably use a dev test subscription um, and, uh, uh, and an enterprise dev test subscription, probably not your credits because, you know, unless you, you know, unless you maybe remove that credit card, if you're doing a hundred machines um, probably don't want to do uh your credits. Um, but if you're doing 100 machines in the enterprise dev test, which is unlimited spend um, based on how you invoice, um, you can absolutely do it that way. And in, in, in which case you could essentially um, you know, have your own DIY uh, version of whatever machine you want, whenever you want it. All right. That's pretty powerful too, I will say. Yeah. Uh, so James, we've been talking for like almost an hour about Azure dev test. And, and, you know, to be fair, this week's episode did have Azure dev test in the title. <laughs> so it's hardly any surprise to people. Uh, but okay. there are other Visual Studio benefits. Do, are there some that we need to talk about here in the few minutes we got left? There are. And, and um, I don't know if I can show it uh, very quickly. Um, I might be able to give me a, a second or two. So one of the um, really compelling uh, other benefits 
is you get your own Microsoft 365 subscription with your Azure Dev Test benefits as well. So um, if I, let me show you this real quick. So when you say with your Azure Dev Test subscription, oh, there's sorry. only one subscription, right? Visual Studio subscription. I, I apologize my visual with my Visual Studio. Um, so if I have a pro or enterprise subscription, I get what you call Office 365 subscription as well? Exactly. So let me let me show you what that looks like because that's kind of fun. And I'll show you why. So go to myvisualstudio.com, which is a wonderful website. We've made a lot of great updates to this website. My.visualstudio.com. My.visualstudio.com. And you can see all the other benefits that you have here. And there are there are many of them. Um, one way to like kind of get a good look at all of them is to go to the Visual Studio uh, pricing details page. You can get a high level view of basically what you get um, with your different subscriptions, like how much credits, the pricing, do you get App Center, and here's your Micro 365 developer subscription. So why is this valuable? Why would you do this? Let's say you're like you're you're an Office developer, right? What does that um, mean? What does an office developer do? Let, let's say you are customizing your CMS or you're customizing- um, Oh, uh, like SharePoint? SharePoint. SharePoint? Office plugins and stuff like that? Something on the Power Platform, something like that. Um, so so this is, Microsoft 365 is a SaaS-based platform, right? So um, you know, with that platform, um, we, we update it. We, we kind of keep it up to date in a variety of different ways. But if you're writing any kind of custom solution, or something like that to that SaaS offering for your end users. Let's say it's like an, an app or a plugin. Um, maybe it's specific to your, your, your company. One of the things you might want to do if you have everybody using that is create your own Microsoft 365 developer subscription and go into the settings of that subscription and turn on, I, I think it's called um, targeting, um, to basically uh, set up your 365 tenant to get the latest and greatest updates all the time. So, so think about that for a second. So if I am um, basically, I have this other Microsoft 365 subscription with the latest and greatest updates on it with my custom code, I can see if it works or if it changes or something more to add. And I can do that before the rest of my company gets their Microsoft, Microsoft 365 tenant updated. Oh. So, so for example, let's say there's some new feature like, mm -hmm. like um, Power Platform or Yammer and, and, and nobody else in your company has that, you can get early access to it by having those things on early, like preview access, like our VS Code Insiders preview, any of those great things. It's kind of like the same thing, but for Microsoft 365. And so then you can make sure that your stuff works and you can try out the new things. You can help train up, train out your, uh, your constituents or your developers. Um, and let everybody know, like you are, you are cutting edge. Which, Matt, we know you are cutting edge. But uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I, there's one thing I want to do, and I, I, and it has to do with Teams, Microsoft Teams. I, you know, I, I don't know why I can't very easily get a sort of a, I want a light bulb to change red when I'm in a meeting. Okay. Yeah. You know? And that seems like well, Outlook knows if I have something on the calendar, and and Teams know whether I have a call going, and. Um, Sounds like I can use these benefits to hook into the APIs of, of both Outlook and Teams to 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 do some solution that works with uh, you get my whole automation system. It does it automatically. Jonas says, uh, "What does what automatically? I want a light bulb to change. I need that. Nothing happens automatically. I have to set that up." Jonas, what are you talking about? But don't you have that? So you you got kids. We talked about this before we went live. I got a couple of kids. You got one more. And um, like, don't they come in, knock on your door, and and it would be nice if you could like signal that, hey, you know, I'm in a meeting. Don't well, well, IoT device or something out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like you can you can do that on your own, and like you can you, you have access to all the downloads um, on your machine. You have you can play with whatever you want and try that out. And then if you then contextualize that to an enterprise. You can think about how if you have that early access, again, this is how you get a promotion. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> you, you, basically, you basically innovate. 
and mm-hmm. and you um and, and you're 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 out there and you're you're doing the right thing and at the same time you're protecting your company. Yeah. Yep. That's awesome. All right. So it looks like we got through all the questions. Like there is one here. I don't know if you know anything. I I for sure do not. It's about like um Microsoft Microsoft certifications. Do you know anything about that? I know a little bit about the certifications. Um I'm not sure there is some things you can do within the, um, of course, your benefits, like there's training and things of that nature um, that help you with preparing for some of those things. I'm not certain if it provides you a subsidy for the test, though. I'm not not sure about that, if that's a good question. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. So sorry, the real Criff, I think is what it says. Uh, yeah, we don't know. Sorry. <laughs> All right. And with that, we are out of time. So thank you so much, everybody, for uh, tuning in and listening to us babble along on something as cool as Azure DevTest, which is way cooler than I thought. And James, thank you so much for uh, teaching me about it. Thanks for having me, Matt. All right. So until next week, I think next week, is is that the last? I think that's the last Monday before the week of Thanksgiving. Do we have a show there? I'm not sure. I'll have to follow up. Um, but uh, But anyway... Hope to see you next week, if nothing else. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.